Afternoon, everyone. My name is Rachel Bowen Pittman. I'm the Executive Director of the United Nations Association of the USA. And I'd like to thank our two partners, Columbia Law School Human Rights Institute and US Human Rights Network. And I also um, would extend a thank you to our UN missions. Hopefully they will join us today for this program. And it's also just really good to see a lot of interest from civil society here today. Um, and it's great to know that we've done a lot of great work around the UPR. Um, just one fact that some of you may not know, we're really proud um, in our history to have had Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, as you hopefully know, she played a central role in drafting the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But she was also one of our earliest members. Um, she was on the UNA's board uh, and was a really big champion. But today, UNA USA is a grassroots movement of Americans that support the work of the UN. And we have 20,000 members across the US and over 200 chapters in 45 states and growing. We'll hit 50 one day. Um, but our um, um, activation in the UPR uh, took place throughout 2019. Uh, our chapters all across the US got involved in this program to talk about the human rights um, issues and um, solutions for the United States. We completed 30 consultations on a variety of topics, um, every, anything from election integrity to gender equality. So the great thing that I think we learned by doing the UPRs is that anyone and everyone can get involved and have a say um, on how we feel that um, human rights um, issues are, are occurring in our country and um, things that we think need to be resolved. So it was a really good process and we had a, a lot of partners in our consultations. Way in, in four way in those four ways. Um, everywhere from um, the New York chapter of uh, Blacks and Law Enforcement of America. Um, we had a state senator in St. Louis participate. So it was, we had a lot of really good rich <laughs> discussions um, within our consultations that we produced. So I hope all of us here today will continue to stay engaged um, on the UPR and human rights overall. And just a short plug, if you wanna uh, keep in, involved in this, one thing you could do is we're having our Global Engagement Summit at the UN on March 27th. So I encourage you to sign up if you're interested in that and you'll be in New York City. We have um, Ambassador um, Kelly Craft from the US Mission that will be our keynote speaker. So you can find out more about that on unausa.org. But at this time, I'd like to turn the microphone over to my colleague, moderator, master, <laughs> Josh Cooper. Um, who's with the U.S. Human Rights Network and is also on the UNA USA National Council. So thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel, for welcoming us here. And it's an honor to be here. And we do hope our two will show up very soon. And um, this is uh, the second month that we've been organizing these UPR briefings, consultations. We know civil society worked really diligently, even UNA's national conference had a great opening and then subsequent different sessions throughout the, the national gathering. And we know looking around the table, AFSC, we had an event in Atlanta with UPR cities, Washington DC just yesterday. And so it's been an exciting effort to see everyone engage across the country, the voice of civil society saying loud and clearly that we the people are still in. Even though the US is withdrawing in many ways and doing things that really challenge the universal order that Eleanor Roosevelt worked so hard on, it's important that we, the people, know how vital it is and how dedicated we are to the process. As we know, May 11th will be the universal periodic review date, but it's important for us all to reach out and have events such as this where we're able to share not only our five or 10 page documents, but really those one to two pages on what's the question we really want asked during that UPR, during FR review, and more importantly, the recommendations. Because everyone at this table, you're really the experts. You know the policy inside and out better than any government from another country. <coughs> but they're the ones that'll be able to make the questions and recommendations. And as we all know, anything said in Geneva during that time period goes into that final report. So that's why we're having these meetings here prior. 
<clears throat> and we'll look at what's possible as well. We also have a delegation going to Geneva on March 16th and 17th doing side events. That'll take place. And we're also partnering with Advocates for Human Rights to be able to work with people coming to be able to meet with different missions. So there's a lot of opportunities to still organize around prior to the May 11th. And I'll stop there because I think it's really important to hear from everyone. We'll begin with Indigenous peoples and start with Indigenous rights. And I believe Bernadette is great to see her again. Bernadette is with the Gwich'in Steering Committee and she'll be focusing on the human rights of the Gwich'in people. Bernadette, can you hear us? Um, yes, I can. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay. Um, Shorji Bernadette Dementi Boji, Kuchajakuts and Eatli. My name is Bernadette Dementif. I'm the executive director of the Gwich'in Steering Committee. We represent 15 communities throughout Alaska and Canada, and I am from the community of Fort Yukon, which is eight miles above the Arctic Circle. The Gwich'in have had a spiritual and cultural connection to the porcupine caribou herd since time immemorial. Protect, protection of the birthing and nursery grounds is a human rights issue. The caribou are the foundation of our culture and our spirituality. They provide food, clothing, and tools. And they are the basis of our song stories and our dances. There was a time when we were able to communicate with them and we made a vow to take care of each other. The Arctic refuge known to my people as Ejikwatsan, Gondai Gotlit, the sacred place where life begins, is not just a piece of land with oil underneath. It is sacred to the Gwich Inn. The U.S. government has ignored our concerns and dismissed our voices. They are fast-tracking oil and gas development as we speak. Alaska is experiencing climate change at twice the rate as the rest of the world. The indigenous peoples are always the first to feel the negative impacts. We are not asking for anything for the ability to continue to live and thrive off the land and the animals that Creator blessed us with. I'm asking for your help and your solidarity because climate change don't care what color we are. Don't care if we're black, brown, or white, old or young, rich or poor. We are all going to feel the negative impacts of it. And it's time we start looking, start working together so that our children will have a future in our homelands. I thank you for having me. Masit Cho. Mahalo Bernadette, thank you also for setting the tone of being on time. We really appreciate that. And also being so profound, knowing that we have to stand together with the planet so we all can have a future. I'll now move to Zoe with First Peoples Worldwide. Uh, thank you, Josh, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Josh mentioned, my name is Zoe Osterman. I'm a staff attorney with First Peoples Worldwide. We are a program based at the University of Colorado. Um, we work from a foundation of indigenous values to achieve a sustainable future for all. And we have been participating in the UPR process alongside um, the Gwich'in Steering Committee. So. For those of you who want a face with the name that you just heard, um, our one pager has a photo of Bernadette um, <clears throat> on here in the back of the room. Um, and um, as you heard from Bernadette, who is the executive director of the Gwich'in Steering Committee, the United States is currently fast tracking oil and gas development in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in uh, Northeast Alaska in violation of the Gwich'in's human rights. Um, as I mentioned, we've been participating in the process and filed a report in October, um, which we have copies of both. I have hard copies and there are some available online. And to stay within my two minutes, I'm not going to detail um, all of our questions and recommendations at this point, but I do want to highlight that what is taking place um, in Alaska with the Gwich Inn is aligned with an ongoing pattern of human rights violations against indigenous people across the country. Um, and this is particularly the case in the context of large scale energy and resource development projects. Um, and as you heard from Bernadette up in Alaska, indigenous peoples are often on the front line of climate change. They're both the um, first line of defenders as well as those who are often most impacted by the changes in their environment. And I want to point to a report by the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples made to the Human Rights Council in which she stated that Indigenous people in the United States wrestle with the realities of living in ground zero of energy impact. And despite the recommendations made by the previous special rapporteur in 2012, significant work still needs to be done to implement policies and initiatives to further the rights of indigenous people in this country. Um, I am going to stop there, but um, do encourage, I know there are no 
uh, delegates here right now, but um, just encourage everyone to um, make sure you're speaking to the people who are the communities and the, the humans, the individuals that are most impacted by violation. So thank you for your time. And thank you, Zoe. Christina Cabrera will be coming in on land and water sovereignty campaign. Hi, Christina Cabrera, Chanchip Deer Spirit from the Placid Wampanoag Tribe of the Poconocet Nation, representing a collaboration of the Land and Water Sovereignty Campaign, Placid Poconocet Land Trust, Placid Wampanoag Tribe of the Poconocet Nation, Indigenous Peoples Network, and members of the Narragansett Tribe, a federally recognized tribe. Uh, we want to state that there have been numerous violations of UNDRIP broken treaties, disregard for indigenous nations and indigenous sovereignty, tribal governance, indigenous land and water sovereignty, um, desecration of sites and no um, regard <coughs> to mother earth rights, pollution, uh, extermination of natural food chain and of our trout, uh, failure to comply with the indigenous participation consultation and free prior and informed consent and perpetuation of cultural genocide of indigenous peoples. We see these examples in our Fall River Tiverton Reservation in the Pocasset Wampanoag tribe, which was um, uh, through eminent domain and blocked access to the land and drinking water. We've seen um, a lot of extermination of original trout and um, desecration of uh, original villages and burial grounds. We see this in the attempts to privatize the waters of Sichuan Reservoir. We see this in the Port of Providence, uh, the silencing of our communities and tribes uh, being removed from public meetings and convenings, blocked by EPA and local government. Uh, the Port of Providence is a major economic driver for the state. And we see this also with the Narragansett uh, uh, tribes not being able to access the grandfather ocean for their sacred ceremonies, risking um, arrest. Um, this is cultural genocide. Again, we recommend and we request uh, establishing indigenous restitution system, establishing a personhood of uh, Mother Earth and um, um, Mother Earth rights, uplifting and upholding Mother Earth rights, and um, adopting the uh, UNDRIP as a convention beyond uh, a declaration and adopting Mother Earth rights uh, for, uh, as a declaration um, at the UN level. Uh, we ask that governments withdraw from extractive fuel, fossil fuel economy as well. Uh, I would like to say that Chief Lord Spring Buffalo from the Pocasset Wampanoag tribe is also present. He might want to say a, a few words. I have to look at our time, are we? Um, I'm not sure if we have time for, maybe at the end. I know yeah, Chief George, you were on yesterday, so we're just gonna be able, if we have time at the end to include you, is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, uh, even if you just record uh, you know, what I said yesterday, that's fine. We have that from yesterday. So thank you so much. We appreciate that. And it was great to meet you this summer when we had the consultation there with the community. Yeah. And it's excellent to have the follow-up. We'll you. then be moving on to immigration, refugees, and displaced people. Miriam Abaya talking about family separation. Good afternoon. My name is Miriam Abaya, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Young Center for Immigrant Children's Rights. Our mission is to promote the best interests of immigrant children according to the Convention on the Rights of the Child and United States law. We do this in our role as independent child advocate by making recommendations to federal agencies on behalf of children to whom we are appointed and by advocating for policies that ensure consideration of children's best interests in immigration proceedings. Fundamental to our best interest advocacy and United States international legal obligations is the right to family unity. My comments today therefore focus on our concerns with the United States policy and practice of unlawfully separating children from their parents. <clears throat> we have worked to reunify families separated by the government since 2017. That work continues today for families separated based on vague allegations of criminal conduct or unfitness and under the mig migrant protection protocols where parents are sent to Mexico without their children, making communication and reunification nearly impossible. By applying best interest principles from both international and domestic law to hundreds of these cases, the Young Center has found that separation was contrary to the best interests of the child in nearly every case. Separating families to deter migration is never in the best interest of children, 
and violates the United States obligations under multiple human rights treaties, including the Refugee Convention. We therefore call on the United States to stop separating children from their caregivers unless there is viable evidence of an imminent threat to the child's safety and to end a program that denies entry to families seeking asylum at the southern border. We further urge the United States to ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which will fundamentally advance the rights of immigrant children in the United States, particularly consideration of their best interests and family unity. Thank you for this opportunity, and I would be happy to provide our full written recommendation. Thank you, Marion, very much. Denise Bell with Amnesty International USA. Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Denise Bell. I'm a researcher with Amnesty International. We are an international human rights grassroots organization. <clears throat> Amnesty International is concerned about policies impacting refugees and asylum seekers, specifically at the U.S.-Mexico border, where asylum seekers are placed at grave risk and subjected to ill treatment and prolonged and indefinite detention. Amnesty International is also concerned about policies that have in hindered the USA's refugee resettlement program. I would like to briefly bring attention to three areas impacting asylum seekers. First, the externalization of the asylum process at the U.S. southern border. Second, the arbitrary detention and ill treatment of asylum seekers, which has constituted torture in some cases. And third, the prolonged and indefinite detention of children asylum seekers. I would also like to bring attention to U.S. policies hindering the USA's refugee resettlement program. The USA is abdicating responsibility for refugee protection by repeatedly and drastically cutting the number of refugees resettled to the USA. With regard to asylum policies, Amnesty International calls on the US government to immediately halt illegal pushbacks of asylum seekers at the US-Mexico border and facilitate their prompt reception and the processing of their cases under US law. Discontinue all plans and actions that would require asylum seekers at the US-Mexico border to wait in Mexico during consideration of their asylum claims under the Migration Protection Protocols, halt family separations in all circumstances except following a rigorous determination of the best interest of the child, ensure that liberty is the default position and that authorities detain asylum seekers only as a last resort when it is determined to be necessary and proportionate to a legitimate purpose based on an assessment of an individual's particular circumstances and ensure that immigrant children are not detained and release children to appropriate sponsors as soon as possible in all cases. With regard to refugee resettlement, Amnesty International calls on the U.S. government to rescind the Muslim ban and the enhanced vetting procedures put in place for refugees in need of resettlement. We have issue briefs at the back covering a range of topics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Denise. We now have Jean Betsock Stillman, a person I haven't <coughs> seen in a while, but I'm so glad you'll be joining us, focusing on border family separation policy and treatment of children in custody, and continue the conversation we started here. We think you might be on mute since we can't hear you. Mm. <laughs> oh, we heard something. Am I there now? Oh, yes. yes. Loud and loud. <laughs> Hi. Hey, Joshua and everybody. Um, the Southern New York State Division of UNAUSA submitted its individual stakeholder report with a focus on immigrant children and human rights. We organized a grassroots consultation with 44 ex uh, invited experts and community members, and as well as a dozen civil society co-sponsors. Uh, in our report, we identified prominent trends, recommendations, and other content that emerged. And these were submitted with the goal of constructively advancing human rights in the U.S. Our report divide, uh, addressed three issues, effects of immigrant policies on children, family separation policy and legal representation, and treatment of children in custody. Uh, migrant ch uh, on the legal framework, migrant children are, should be entitled to all of the human rights established in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as well as other human rights treaties that the U.S. has ratified. And we all know that we have not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, which we recommend be done. Uh, with the effect of recent immigration policies on children, 
Beginning in 2017, the Trump administration issued 19 executive orders or took other actions designed to restrict immigration. Uh, restrictions on these admi uh, admissions have had a particularly adverse effect on children whose families are fleeing violence and persecution in their home countries. The divisions report makes the following recommendations for the US. First, extend refugee status to asylum seekers fleeing domestic and gang violence in their country of origin. Uphold America's obligations to protect the human rights of those fleeing their countries in the darkest of times and not place barriers in their path. And ensure the rights of immigrant families and children are protected no matter their legal status. Uh, on the family separation policy and legal representation, the administration announced in May 2018 a zero tolerance policy by which it would prosecute parents who cross the US border illegally with their children, separate parents from their children pending resolution of their cases, and place the children in shelters or with families. Photos of weeping children, <laughs> of teens caring for babies who have been jailed in cages, of lines of children and teens being moved from one place to another, have peppered newspapers and social media, resulting in outcries throughout the country. Immigrant children who are subject to deportation or asylum hearings are not entitled to court-appointed lawyers. Further increased immigration rates mean the judges are overburdened. Uh, recommendations for the United States uh, completely revoke the family separation policy and take all necessary measures to reunite children with their families. This is still barely a work in progress. Provide immigrants, especially unaccompanied children, with legal services during immigration and asylum hearings. And third, provide additional support to immigration judges and attorneys to ensure that cases are reviewed in a timely and thorough manner. With regard to treatment of Thank children you. in custody. Dean, we're running out of time in that one. Oh, if we could wrap, just so we can be concerned of all the other people around very, very large uh, table. Let me give you just uh, two points. We should seek alternates to the present detention system, including emphasis on due process, justice, and humane treatment, and improve conditions of confinement to meet, to meet basic human rights standards. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll go on now to Michael, looking at reintegration of displaced populations and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Hi, everybody. My name is Michael Salm. I am the Director of Leadership Development and Strategic Partnerships at Rutgers University, as well as the Vice President for Programming of the Northern New Jersey chapter of the United Nations Association. Uh, I want to talk to you about the reintegration of forced environmental migrants, or um, more aptly identified as climate refugees. They're people who are forced to leave their home region due to sudden or long-term changes in their local environments. Successful reintegration of these individuals directly touches upon nine of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and will hit closer to home than most of us realize. Brookings released a report last year that estimated that in 2017, there were approximately 22.5 million uh, climate refugees, a number that will only continue to grow annually. Coast, coastal communities from Florida to Maine, California to Alaska, and around the world will be affected by rising sea levels. Farmers here and abroad will find themselves without a harvest because of changing weather patterns. Internationally and domestically, how we address this looming crisis will directly affect the quality of life of millions of people. Through innovative programming, continuation of education, and retraining efforts, intentional support and resource networks, and creative collaborations, we can forward the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, invigorate our local communities and economies, and make the world a better place. Um, my direct interest is the utilization of sports as a mechanism to promote peace and cultural understanding. Um, I think sports and music tend to be two of the most universal languages in the world. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much. And great to connect the aspect of food security, which is often missed, especially with climate as we look long term. We're now moving into gender and reproductive justice. I'd like to welcome Amanda, focusing on the rights of women and non-binary persons with disabilities in the USA. Hi everyone, my name is Amanda McRae. I'm from Women Enabled International, which works to advance the rights of women and girls with disabilities worldwide. 
Working with the Lurie Institute for Disability Policy at Brandeis University, we documented as part of our UPR report the situation for parental rights of persons with disabilities in the US. In 2018, Women Enabled was asked to intervene in a case here in New York of a woman with an intellectual disability who had her newborn child removed from her care upon her leaving the hospital just a couple days after birth. The reason for this was that she failed to attend parenting <coughs> classes that had been mandated by the Administration for Children's Services here in New York, despite the fact that they had not provided her the reasonable accommodation she needed to attend those classes. As we learned more about that problem, um, we found many more disturbing statistics. Uh, indeed, people with disabilities across this country are much more likely to have child protective services involved in their parenting and to have their parental rights removed as a result. For people with psychosocial and intellectual disabilities, in some states, it's as high as 80% involvement in those cases. Furthermore, this is based, this involvement is often based on stereotypes about the ability of people with disabilities to parent. And those stereotypes are particularly pernicious within the services that are provided to people with disabilities, whether it's healthcare services, support services, or even within child protective services themselves. Now, this discrimination is occurring despite one of the strongest legal frameworks in the world protecting the rights of people with disabilities, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And we would hope that states as part of this UPR process would question the US about why they have not applied the ADA to ensure the parental rights of people with disabilities and have not worked to raise awareness among service providers about those rights. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think we also need to look at the Commission on Rights of Persons with Disabilities and ratify that as well as the other ones we have. Absolutely, yeah. All right, moving on to Kate Kelly, focusing on women's rights. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kate Kelly, and I work at Equality Now, uh, organization that focus on, on the rights of women and girls all around the world. 85% um, of constitutions globally have an equal rights provision or pro, uh, prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex or gender. The United States Constitution does not. Uh, in the U.S., uh, it wasn't until the 1970s that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, uh, which was first ratified in 1868, was ever applied to the cases of discrimination against women. Still today, a lower standard of judicial scrutiny is applied to sex discrimination under the 14th Amendment. A litigant bringing a challenge under the strict scrutiny standard, uh, which applies to race, religion, national origin, alienage, uh, has a 73% chance of success, while a litigant bringing a challenge under intermediate scrutiny has only a 47% chance of success. The United States is also a part, a part of a tiny minority of countries that have not ratified the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, or CEDAW, uh, standing out as the only country in the Western Hemisphere and the only industrialized democracy that has not ratified CEDAW. Article 2 of CEDAW reads, in part, state parties contend discrimination in, in all its forms and agree to embody the principle of the equality of men and women in their national constitutions. The U.S. is a clear global outlier when it comes to constitutional protection of women and marginalized genders, and not in a good way. Virginia, the 38th and final state necessary under Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution, ratified the Equal Rights Amendment in January of 2020. The U.S. should, without delay, integrate this new gender provision into its constitution. This will eliminate a major barrier to the ratification of CEDAW and increase the legal protection for all Americans who experience discrimination on the basis of sex. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, Carrie McLean, Reproductive Justice on the remote. We also believe you're on mute. That's well as our observant mute person, and she keeps track of that to let us know where we're at. I don't see her name um, in the list of participants. Okay. So maybe we can come back. No problem. See. We'll move to Penelope Saunders then, focusing on violations of the rights of sex workers, in particular immigrant and transgender communities. Thank you very much. Um, I'm here as part of a coalition of five organizations, um, and it's we're listed on the top of our one-page statement, but that's New Jersey Red Umbrella Alliance, Desiree Alliance, the Outlaw Project, my group, BPPP, and the Black Sex Worker Collective. Um, often sex work is seen as a secondary issue. In fact, when we look at human rights and civil rights, it's a primary issue. 
it, it's a major cause for incarceration across the United States, uh, for people becoming homeless, for people being deported, and for other rights violations. So we've spoken a lot today in other sessions about the fact that the current US administration is violating the rights of immigrants. The intersection of this with anti-prostitution policies has resulted in the death of migrant sex workers at the hands of state agents. Um, the US has also engaged in a sustained campaign to roll back the rights of transgender people. Trans people are assumed to be sex workers by the authorities, leading to incarceration and immigration detention where, of course, they are harmed. We bring to your attention the cases of Roxana Hernandez, a transgender woman who died while seeking asylum in 2018, Leilene Polanco, an Afro-Latino transgender woman who died in solitary confinement in New York City in 2019, and Yang Song, an immigrant woman who died as a result of a New York City anti-prostitution raid in 2017. She was forced to jump from a window by the vice squad. Uh, so the US has passed new laws since the last UPR, such as the 2018 Stop Enabling Sex Tra Traffickers Act, SESTA, and FOSTA. And this legislation limits the, vital, the sharing of vital safety information for se sex workers online and causes economic harm. We have three recommendations. End the criminalization of sex workers' lives. Vigorously investigate and put an end to policing practices targeting transgender people, in particular in regards to prostitution, and address the atrocities of current immigration and migration border policies in the US that impact all migrants, including sex workers. There's a whole raft of policies that allow people to be deported purely because of suspicion that they have engaged in sex work. Removing that would go a long way in terms of ensuring the human rights of migrants more generally. Thank you. Thank you, Penelope. Now handing it over to Carolina with Center for Reproductive Rights. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Carolina Van Mensburg with the Center for Reproductive Rights. Since the United States is last UPR, the landscape for reproductive rights and justice has worsened dramatically, resulting in a significant retrogression of rights with particularly harmful impact on people experiencing multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. Our joint submission focuses on the four following areas. First, Abortion access is under attack in the United States. The US Supreme Court has repeatedly affirmed the constitutional right to abortion, yet states continue to pass laws that shut down clinics, impose medically unnecessary regulations, and shame women for their decisions. There is currently a patchwork of access to abortion care across the US. Six states have only one abortion provider. Second, the US has expanded the concept of religious refusals far beyond its appropriate scope by introducing regulations that have or will result in limited access to or denial of care, particularly in the field of sexual and reproductive health care. Third, the US is only one of 13 countries where maternal mortality is on the rise. This crisis disproportionately impacts black and indigenous women. The majority of US maternal deaths are preventable, yet the US government fails to adequately prioritize or monitor maternal deaths. And fourth, the US has reinstituted and expanded the global gag rule which prohibits non-governmental organizations around the world that receive US global health assistance from supporting safe abortion services or related counseling or referrals. Your delegations are well positioned to remind the US of its human rights obligations and call attention to the escalating attacks on reproductive health rights and justice. We respectfully urge your delegations to recommend that the US first enact federal legislation affirming the constitutional right to abortion and refrain from passing laws that interfere with the right to abortion and bodily autonomy. Two, take measures to ensure that laws permitting refusals of care based on religious or moral beliefs guarantee seamless access to reproductive health care. Three, guarantee access to and availability of comprehensive health care services, free from racial bias, including access to respectful maternal health care. And four, revoke the, glo the global gag rule. Thank you. Thank you, Carolina. We'll now go to Logan Kenny on sexual assault in the US military. Hey everyone, I'm Logan Kenny on behalf of the Cornell Gender Justice Clinic. At the 2015 Universal Periodic Review of the US, Slovenia and Denmark both called upon the United States to address the problem of sexual assault in the US military. In particular, they called for the US to engage in preventative work and to ensure access to justice for survivors. In 2018, the Department of Defense estimated that more than 20,000 members experienced sexual assault that year alone. 
which is a 38% increase from 2016. Nevertheless, the U.S. has failed to implement the recommendations made at the 2015 UPR. We've brought hard copies of our 2019 UPR shadow report as well as our two-pager, which are over there. There are six key areas in which we believe there are, is, still a need, a, is still a need for reform. First, the U.S. military fosters a culture of impunity. Claims of sexual violence are rarely investigated or prosecuted. And when they are, perpetrators often receive minimal or no punishment at all. Second, most survivors are effectively restricted to seeking redress within the military justice system alone. Those survivors are entitled to voice a non-binding preference to prosecute in a military or a civilian court. Most are not informed of that choice at all. Survivors are also barred by judicial doctrine from bringing claims against the military in civilian federal courts. Third, the accused unit commander retains incredible power over the proceedings. Commanders can make disciplinary recommendations and amend sanctioning de determinations. Their lack of legal training and responsibility to sec successfully carry out missions, their close working relationships with both, both accused and sometimes survivors compromise their ability to handle these cases impartially and justly. Fourth, the U.S. fails to protect survivors who experience retaliation for reporting. Fifth, LGBTQ service members face a heightened risk of sexual harassment and violence. And six, survivors face discrimination when seeking disability claims because claims for PTSD related to military sexual trauma are held to a higher evidentiary standard than other disability claims. In light of the rising rates of military sexual assault in the United States and the continuation of these systematic barriers to justice, uh, reform in these six areas is absolutely necessary. Thank you. Thank you so much. Farah Diaz-Tello, looking at criminalization of reproductive decisions and pregnancy outcomes. Hi, thank you. My name is Farah Diaz-Tello, and I'm senior counsel with If When How, lawyering for reproductive justice. Um, and I wanted to acknowledge my colleagues from National Advocates for Pregnant Women and from Movement for Family Power, who jointly submitted a report uh, with us this October. Um, you've heard about the tightening restrictions that lawmakers are, are placing on reproductive health care, targeting abortion care in particular. Um, our organizations wish to address the punitive policies that are applied to women, trans, and gender nonconforming individuals based on their reproductive decisions or experiences. Um, our organizations have observed an increase in the use of criminal and civil punishment against people based on acts or omissions during their pregnancies. This includes the arrest of dozens of women who have ended their pregnancies outside of the formal medical system, often due to poverty or inaccessibility of abortion care. Uh, it includes hundreds of criminal prosecutions of people who use drugs or who have substance use disorders for giving birth, regardless of whether their babies are born healthy. It also involves the separation of thousands of parents from their newborns uh, and parents from their children on the basis of allegations of drug use or factors which are most frequently indicia of poverty. Um, proceedings in these cases are rife with procedural violations. People who've just lost a pregnancy or given birth are subjected to bedside interrogation by law enforcement. Pregnant people who use drugs or alcohol may be hailed into civil commitment proceedings uh, in which procedural protections are suspended and a lawyer is provided for the fetus and not for the pregnant person. Um, perhaps the most cruel and perverse outcome of these prosecutions and uh, civil punishments is that they insert stigma and fear of arrest into seeking reproductive health care, uh, deterring people from seeking help when they most need it. And this is contrary to the recommendations of medical and public health experts. The fundamental question that we hope that states will ask the U.S. Uh, is when it will acknowledge what human rights experts ha have already reinforced, that um, punishing pregnancy outcomes is a form of sex-based discrimination. Um, so in that, we have uh, five key recommendations. First, the U.S. and all jurisdictions uh, eliminate both laws and practices that criminally and civilly punish people for charges related to pregnancy decisions or outcomes, including abortions, miscarriages, stillbirths, or other outburst, uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes. Second, prioritize funding for universal health care that, uh, that prioritizes abortion care as a part of, of uh, reproductive health care and evidence-based approaches to health concerns during pregnancy, including substance use disorders. Third, ensure the avail availability of social services completely severed from child protective services. Uh, fourth, ensure that all jurisdictions establish an absolute right to assign legal counsel for parents at every stage of child welfare investigations even investigative phase. And finally, that federal and state laws protect patients' rights to full and informed consent for all testing procedures during pregnancy. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. We now move into the criminal justice panel and we'd like to welcome Thomas H. Speedy Rice, focusing on death penalty abuses. Thank you. Um, since the last UPR, the United States has executed 122 people. Um, at, at least six have been seriously botched, amounting to agony, pain, torture, and extended time of the person's uh, death being brought about. <coughs> A lot of this is occurring because pharmaceutical companies, as well as the Food and Drug Administration, have banned or barred many of the chemicals in the past used for executions. Um, and so states are going to um, formularies and creating chemicals, coming up with formulas to execute. And the first time they even know if it works or not is when they experiment on the human subject they're executing. Uh, we're seeing this over and over. To protect themselves, the states are passing secrecy and gag laws and the criminalizing the disclosure of the drugs or disclosure of who makes the drugs. Likewise, at the time of execution, more states have passed laws where they close the curtain so the witnesses to the execution see the start of the execution but do not see or hear anything of the execution and how long it might take or how agonizing it might be. Um, it's, a it's really a form of torture that we've moved into and experimentation that needs to be addressed in this program, particularly under the Torture Convention. Likewise, we still suffer rampant discrimination in the use of the death penalty. 42% of individuals on death row are African American or black. Um, when, they're, when that population is it's way below the number in the US population. Um, the continued use of the death penalty against minorities in Los Angeles County alone in the last seven years, 23 people have been sent to death row 22 have been people of color. So this, these violations of the CERD are also need to be addressed. We would like to, we'd like to stress that the committee point out to the United States these continuing violations, the need to address these, to cease these violations, and to work in, work within our policies respect for SDG 16, and particularly um, adopt the second optional protocol. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for even linking in the SDGs with the CAT as well as optional protocols. Now handing over to Jennifer Jones on prisoners' rights. Uh, Jennifer, I see you on Zoom, but I'm not sure if your audio is hooked up. I'm not seeing that you have the, your mic connected. Um, Okay. Maybe we can come back at just the end for the, of the sake panel. of time. Just please indicate uh, on the computer when you're available, <coughs> and then we'll go to Cynthia Suhu. Oh, great. Um, good afternoon. I'm Cynthia Suhu, the co-director of the Human Rights and Gender Justice Clinic at CUNY Law School. I'll be addressing the treatment of pregnant people detained detained in jails and prisons, as well as in immigration detention in the United States. This issue is discussed in our joint submission with ten reproductive justice uh, rights and justice organizations, as well as our fact sheet. Human rights bodies have repeatedly emphasized that detention and imprisonment of pregnant women should only occur in, in exceptional circumstances and that pregnant people are entitled to special protection. Yet, in 2017, the U.S. ended a policy that prohibited the immigration detention of pregnant people except in extraordinary circumstances. As a result, in 2018, over 2,000 pregnant women were detained in immigration facilities. On the criminal justice side, over the last 30 years, the number of women in prison in the United States has skyrocketed. And as a result, each year, approximately 12,000 people are incarcerated while pregnant, and about 1,400 of them give birth while in custody. Um, pregnant people in custody are subject to cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. Human rights bodies have repeatedly emphasized that the United States should not shackle pregnant women during labor, transport, and um, after birth. Yet, despite these laws and policies, shackling and the the, the practice of shackling continues in criminal detention, and we're now seeing it in the immigration uh, detention context. Pregnant women in jails have also been placed in solitary confinement, which is a clear violation of international human rights law. In detention, pregnant people are routinely denied adequate prenatal care and emergency medical treatment, which can result in pregnancy complications and miscarriages. The U.S. has reported that between October uh, 2016 and uh, uh, August 2018, 28 immigrant women may have experienced a miscarriage just prior to or while in custody of Immigration and Customs Enforcement. The mistreatment continues through labor and deliver, de delivery, and most concerning, pregnant people in custody often face loss of their children. Recently, doctors have reported that federal agencies have taken newborns from detained immigrants 
um, following delivery, placing the babies with state authorities with no guarantee that the parents will be able to regain custody. And when women in prison give birth, babies typically will be placed in foster care unless a family member can take care of the child. And under current US law, if a mother is incarcerated for more than 15 months, her parental rights may be terminated. Our re recommendations are that the, um, the US should ensure that pregnant individuals are not, um, uh, are not detained or incarcerated um, except as a last resort and that uh, detained pregnant people should have access to prenatal emergency and abortion uh, emergency and abortion care and not face the loss of their children while giving birth in custody and the u.s should, should ensure that detained pregnant people um, be treated with dignity and respect and that the use of solitary confinement shackles and other forms of restraints be banned throughout pregnancy and during labor delivery and postpartum recovery thank you thank you very much cynthia we're now moving we have jennifer back. we now have jennifer back jennifer that was we're, we're glad to be able to include you. Jennifer, you have the floor. Uh, yes, I do. Can you hear me? Very clear. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Jones, and I represent, along with attorney Audrey Balms, uh, the Jailhouse Lawyer Speak organization. Um, I'm also co-chair of the NLG Mass Incarceration Committee Working Group, helping to assist the JLS International Law Project and also an attorney and policy advocate at NDH Law Firm. Uh, most importantly, however, uh, on the second to last day of Black History Month are the statements of Mr. Sundiana Jawanza, the head of the jailhouse lawyer speak. Uh, they speak for themselves and in solidarity with them, their statement uh, to this meeting is as follows. Thank you to everyone who has taken a moment to speak with me on behalf of the JLS International Law Project. JLS stands for Jailhouse Lawyers Speak, a national prisoners-led human rights organization. My name is Cindiana Jawanza. I'm a U.S. prisoner and jailhouse lawyer. The reason I'm before you is that the U.S., as a U.S. prisoner, we wish to highlight U.S. prisoners' concerns of international human rights violations to the international community. Currently, America is the number one jailer on the face of the earth. Never in human history have millions of people been known to be in cages as prisoners in one country. With this number in the millions comes grave injustices and human rights abuses on a massive scale. What's different with jailhouse lawyer speak organizing efforts here is that prisoners are organizing themselves for direct action and awareness campaigns on a national and international level in the US. Yes, you could say we are the modern day underground railroad. <laughs> Instead of the international community only learning of one state prison or jail human rights abuses, our efforts are concentrated in bringing awareness to the entire US prison and being in violation of international laws. We do have a priority list. First on our priority list is notice of what we call in America legalized prison slavery. Under international law, slavery is a flagrant violation Currently, the UN recognizes and lists countries that practice slavery. What we notice is that America is not listed. It is our request that America be recognized as a slavery practicing nation on the list. The clearest evidence of slavery in America is spelled out in the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution. The amendment abolished slavery except as punishment for a crime after being convicted by a court of law. Yet according to international law, there are no exceptions for the practice of slavery. As U.S. prisoners, we have organized resistance to slavery in the last few years to highlight prison slavery. December 9, 2010, prisoners in six Georgia state prisons began historic week-long work to strike, to protest systematic human rights abuses. On top of this list was forced labor or slavery. August 19, 2017, JLS prisoners organized with U.S. citizens demonstrating around the U.S. Jennifer, we went over the time part. If you can. Wrap that for, absolutely. And I appreciate absolutely. Sorry about that. That's Apologies. no problem. Um, so we'd like to also highlight um, the use of solitary confinement and medical practice neglect um, that are stand apart from World Health Organization standards. Thank you for this time. Thank you so very much. We'll now move to local city and state issues. And there's a large campaign this year by UPR Cities. And of course, we're fortunate to have Rachel with us from the first U.S. Human Rights City, celebrating a decade. 11 years now. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. I'm here to share recommendations and findings from the UPR Stakeholder Report entitled 
the situation of human rights in the District of Columbia as concerns the lack of statehood and voting rights, as well as entrenched inequality and the lack of affordable housing, <clears throat> which was prepared and submitted by the United Nations Association of the National Capital Area, the Washington DC Human Rights Cities Alliance, <clears throat> and the George Washington International, the George Washington Law School International Human Rights Clinic following a consultative community process. Our first recommendation focuses on inequality, lack of affordable housing, and homelessness in Washington, D.C. We urge your delegation to recommend that the United States government provide more federal funding across the country, including for Washington, D.C., to combat homelessness and assist in providing affordable and adequate housing to its most vulnerable citizens and encourage local governments like DC to design and to implement appropriate changes in local zoning policies, provide more incentives to develop affordable housing and improve the quality and quantity of low income housing. Our report highlights the shameful legacy of racial discrimination that has haunted American history since the founding of the nation and that remains very much alive in DC today. Decades of racially discriminatory policies and practices have created vast inequalities between black and white residents in DC and nowhere is this more, more <clears throat> um, evident than with inadequate housing and homelessness. In 2019, 87% of the adults experiencing homelessness in DC were black or African American, whereas they make up 47% of all DC residents. Poverty and homelessness and their disproportionate impact on black DC residents are exacerbated by ad inadequate housing policies and practices. From 2000 to 2010, the no, total number of low-income rental units in D.C. fell by more than 50 percent and has continued to the present day. Our second recommendation focuses on D.C. statehood and voting rights. We urge your delegation to recommend that the executive branch of the United States government promote and support passage of legislation granting statehood to D.C., rectifying the injustices of disenfranchisement and lack of local autonomy and bring the United States into line with its obligations under the ICCPR. The ICCPR requires every citizen to have an equal voting right and participate in the public affairs of its government. Despite this requirement, over 700,000 Americans residing in the District of Columbia do not have voting representation in either, the hou either house of the federal legislature. This, remain, this results moreover in significant disenfranchisement of racial and ethnic minorities and a loss of political autonomy. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. David Stillman. Thank you. The uh, United Nations Association uh, Southern New York State Division participated in the, the work of the UNA USA overall last year. And of 11 submitted reports, the division was responsible either leadership or as a uh, participant in five of these. Uh, all of the 11 reports are available on the UNA USA website, uh, unausa.org stroke human rights stroke UPR reports, uh, and a copy of my remarks uh, is available on the side table. So uh, I would like to give you a, a very quick review of a lot of work that was undertaken. Uh, among these five reports that, that we uh, participated in were climate change, race, gender, and criminal justice, election integrity, immigrant children, and race, criminal justice, and human rights. Uh, each of these was the result of research into past and current issues, including previous UPR work by the UN Rights Council, various international agreements and reports, and national reports and policies, and the pertinent articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, this. Uh, uh, work was done on the, uh, the basis of uh, research, seminars, findings, and recommendations. The, uh, uh, the report on climate change, uh, which was done with the University of Hawaii, um, included an overview of impact in general and uh, then dealt specifically with fossil fuels, science-based policies, community empowerment, and agriculture. The highlight of our recommendations were that the U.S. should re-enter the Paris Climate Agreement immediately, <clears throat> consider climate change a national emergency, uh, take steps to eliminate single-use plastics, and create a definition of climate refugee and establish frameworks for supporting those displaced 
the report on race, gender, and criminal justice uh, conducted with the UNA St. Louis chapter uh, has taken me two minutes already. <laughs> All right. Fortunately, election integrity and uh, uh, immigrant children are covered by Marsha Brewster and by Jean Stillman. And the, the run on race and criminal justice, which fits very much into the views by, expressed by others, uh, addresses uh, work that should be accomplished by the U.S. Congress uh, and the criminal justice system to uh, decrease racial profiling. Right, so we'll go and to Marsha Brewster then. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm Marsha Brewster. I represent the UNA of Westchester County um, and the National Council of UNA. Uh, our group, the UNA Westchester and the Southern New York Division, held a consultative community process with 27 local experts um, on election integrity on 5th of September. Specifically, we addressed three main issues. Flawed election administration. This includes the phenomenon of gerrymandering, which redraws voting districts along party lines and effectively reduces the voting power of various groups and it's widespread in the US. Many minority parties and candidates face heavy obstacles to getting on the ballot. Secondly, disenfranchisement of millions of US citizens is a violation of their human rights. Among the disenfranchised citizens being prevented from voting are people currently or previously incarcerated, immigrant naturalized citizens and citizens of Hispanic heritage, and many visually impaired or otherwise disabled people. There have also been widespread recent incidents of people being turned away from polls for various minor and inconsistent application of election rules. Third, security of voting methods. As you know, there is currently a lack of transparency and oversight regarding the security of electronic voting machines in the US. Vulnerabilities in these electronic voting systems could potentially allow hackers to distort votes and the election results. Paper ballots are essential to ensuring election security. And these are the five recommendations. Uh, enhanced measures to ensure a more accurate 2020 census and improve accurate redistricting and address gerrymandering. Second, immediately end the disenfranchisement of currently or previously incarcerated people, naturalized citizens and disabled people. Third, uphold the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to combat voter suppression by states and localities. Promote the use of paper ballots to ensure security. Establish national standards for voting machines and introduce procedures for tight and publicly guarded chain of custody of ballots. Increase funding for voting security measures such as ensuring machine safety, training of election personnel, and monitoring of voting centers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We now move on to Leon Su talking about U.S. occupation of Hawaii. Okay. Aloha. Aloha. Uh, my name is Leon Kaulahao Su. I'm actually the Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Hawaiian Kingdom, but I'm here representing um, because the Hawaiian Kingdom does not actually have uh, a voice at the United Nations. I'm here representing uh, <coughs> two um, NGOs. Um, on the island of Hawaii stand five great volcanoes. The tallest is Mauna Kea, <coughs> that rises 4,207 meters above sea level. It is the highest mountain in the Pacific, and if measured from the bottom of the sea, is over 10,000 meters, making it the tallest mountain in the world. A confrontation on Mauna Kea has been in, in the, the news for the past seven months. A powerful international consortium has been seeking to build a giant, gigantic structure on the summit of Mauna Kea to house the world's largest telescope. Hawaiians oppose the project as it would be a desecration of a sacred mountain. But the actual root of the conflict is a unilateral arbitrary imposition of foreign rule over a sovereign country being held captive by the US. The standoff stems from the corrupt operations of the US and its puppet government, the state of Hawaii, regarding ownership, authority, jurisdiction, trust obligations, and human rights. Mauna Kea amplifies the inherent illegality of the United States claim to and presence in the Hawaiian Islands. In bringing the telescope project to a standstill, Hawaiians are challenging the legitimacy of the United States state of Hawaii through peaceful means, what Hawaiians call kapu aloha. We maintain the diplomatic protest 
uh, registered by our Queen Lilingual Colony in 1893, and call upon member states of the UN to challenge the United States at its Universal Periodic Review to cease and desist its illegal possession operations of the whole and operations in the Hawaiian Islands and stop the egregious violations of human rights of Hawaiian nationals seeking to live in peace and security and in control of our own homelands. Mahalo. Mahalo, Leon, and also continue the recommendation that came up at the last UPR cycle. Yes. Now we move to Diane Kaufman Ward, focusing on state and local government human rights promotion and protection. Thanks for your time uh, and attention. As Josh said, my name is Joanne Kama Ford, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the Columbia Law School Human Rights Institute uh, and the International Association of Official Human Rights Agencies, which represents about 125 state and local agencies working to address uh, discrimination across the United States. Uh, and I want to briefly just emphasize something that's been implicit in many of the comments already the critical role that state and local governments play in making human rights a reality in the United States, and the need for independent national mechanisms to foster human rights monitoring and implementation at the local level within our federal system. I think it's really difficult to overstate at this point the damage done by the federal government's flagrant disregard for and attacks on fundamental human rights, both here at home and on the global level. Uh, and many have already spoken about some of these uh, some of these today. In particular, I want to highlight rollbacks in programs meant to foster equality and combat discrimination, many which have been in place for uh, for many decades, uh, and the newer enactment of laws that prevent cities from strengthening anti-discrimination protections. At the same time, as many of us know, bias and discrimination are on the rise. Um, and the ongoing federal, state, and local human rights violations that we see, which touch upon the CERD and the ICCPR and the UDHR and the UN DRIP, go unchecked in part because the U.S. lacks any domestic infrastructure to monitor human rights, uh, and there are no federal institutions to track or report on violations. So while we know national level leadership on human rights is non-existent, there are cities and states who are keen to do the right thing. Uh, and put their um, communities first, but they lack guidance, support, or resources. Uh, in prior UPRs, the U.S. has been called upon to develop a more comprehensive approach to human rights monitoring and promotion by many governments. And we ask to continue to build that record in this UPR. Uh, and we asked uh, representatives um, at the Human Rights Council to make targeted recommendations for a coordinated approach to human rights promotion and protection, including providing resources to state and local agencies and officials to monitor human rights and establishing independent and transparent federal human rights mechanisms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jen. Jacob Flowers with American Friends Service Committee. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Jacob Flowers, I'm the U.S. Uh, Regional Director for the U.S. South with the American Friends Service Committee. Um, we're an over 100-year-old international peace and justice organization working in 16 countries and 32 U.S. cities around the world. Um, in that work, we work in a grassroots accompaniment model with the communities that we're in partnership with. These communities in the U.S. suffering from the U.S. government's lack of protections and lack of proactive efforts to respect human rights here domestically. We want to highlight that these violations disproportionately, always disproportionately impact poor and minority communities here in this country. From this work, we have collected the experience of the communities that we're in a company with in a full UPR shadow report that was submitted in October of 2019. Today, we have a, a shortened two-page document available for you with a subset of these recommendations, really focused at the U.S. executive branch in the hopes that they will take up on them. Within the area of immigration and asylum, we urge the U.S. government and urge you to urge the U.S. government to um, end what's known as the Remain in Mexico policies and the migrant protection protocols for asyl asylum seekers to this country. We also urge you to urge the U.S. government to abolish the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Department, reorienting it towards a more positive and productive purpose. Within the area of prisons and detention, we call for the immediate end to the use of solitary confinement um, immediately within the federal prison systems. Within housing, we call for the enforcement of existing housing laws, but call for proactive introduction of legislation that, 
that um, supports just eviction laws, rent control, and the establishment of community land trusts. Within policing, we call for the end of the countering violence extremism program, more specifically with its recent um, move into mental health care, which is very um, scary, and to also set limits on data collection and the use of data, including most importantly, the use of facial recognition software. And to close overall, we call for, the U for member states to urge the U.S. government to immediately put itself forward for election back to the Human Rights Council. We must begin to re-engage there in good faith. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll be to return to Columbia Law School with ensuring access to sanitation for communities in the United States. Thomas Bay. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Bamisho Kweadinyonju, and I'm here with my colleague um, Arusa Koka from the Columbia Law School Human Rights Clinic. I will discuss the failure to realize the right to sanitation within the U.S. The United States is one of the wealthiest countries in the world, yet 1.5 million people in rural communities lack access to adequate and affordable sanitation. What this looks like in practice is that Many households have failing, inadequate, and in some cases, non-existent systems to dispose of their human waste. In many communities, existing centralized water systems are more than 100 years old. Some residents build straight pipes and other makeshift ways to funnel their waste, but these systems can fail, allowing feces and wastewater to accumulate near their homes. As a result, individuals face health risk and exposure to tropical diseases such as hookworm, that were once thought to be eradicated. The burden for improving on-site sanitation currently rests primarily on homeowners who receive little government support and are often unable to afford the high cost of maintaining such systems. In some communities, individuals may incur fines or even criminal records for violating sanitation regulations that they cannot afford to comply with. There remains a lack of political will to address the sanitation crisis reflecting ongoing structural discrimination. Black, indigenous, and migrant communities, those who have historically lacked political power, are the most impacted. As recognized by the UN Special Rapporteur on Poverty, the reality in the United States stands in stark contrast to global human rights standards, which require that sanitation be affordable to all without discrimination. The UPR is an opportunity to promote access to affordable sanitation on an equal basis through funding for rural homes, collecting disaggregated data, and eliminating laws that penalize non-compliance. This is essential to ensuring an adequate standard of living, health, and dignity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And now we move to Noel, looking at the Southern Cities Initiative, the U.S. Human Rights Cities Alliance. Thank you, Josh. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Noel Didler from Jackson, Mississippi, and member of the U.S. Human Rights Cities Alliance Steering Committee and representing Center for Ideas, Equity, Transformative Change, Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, and the Black, Lighthouse Black Girl Projects. The truths and legacies of civil and human rights in deep southern communities continue to inform how organizing, advocacy, and policy work <coughs> shapes the resistances, the rise of progressive municipal leaderships, and the municipal policy and governance processes in southern cities. On the ground organizing through the lens of racial, economic, environmental, food, immigrant, reproductive, gender, and social justice for decades led several communities across the southern states to present to the working group of experts on people of African descent on the human rights violations that are unique to southern people. This took place in 2016 when the working group visited four cities in the United States and one of the stops was Jackson, Mississippi. The Southern Cities Initiative is a priority of the Alliance because, number one, the rise of progressive municipal leaderships across southern cities. Number two, the grassroots organizing that resulted in the rise of progressive leaderships. Number three, the current political climate. Number four, the impact of millennial <coughs> civic, political, and social engagement. The Alliance, in partnership with southern grassroots communities, is in the process of working with southern city leaderships towards building their capacities to fulfill human rights obligations, remedy persistent poverty and inequality, take concerted action to counter racism, xenophobia, and to promote a culture of human rights and democratic values. So far, New Orleans is the only southern city that voted overwhelmingly to establish a human rights commission. Birmingham has an office of social justice, and the strategic vision of the city of Jackson, Mississippi, is rooted in human dignity. You can see the contributions of Southern cities and communities in the U.S. Human Rights Alliance Stakeholder Report. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to honor all of you for 
presenting and sharing. I really, when you look at it, you see people from Waima and Nalo and Hawaii all the way to Washington, D.C., and we're united here to work with one another. I think this is an opportunity that I know when I come here, I'm always enriched by all the information. To get the update, that's 122. You know, we just aren't able to keep up with all the issues on how bad the situation is, but more importantly, we also have all the right tools to be able to organize together. One thing I would say is we definitely listen to each other here. We definitely learn from one another and we have to lead together to organize from our communities to Washington DC and more importantly to Geneva as well. I'm keen to be partnering with everyone here and thinking about how to bring um, your amazing work and energy to the process in Geneva. But as we all know, it's really about getting stuff in Geneva back here locally to support the struggles and the issues and the recommendations that all of us are, are working on. So really thank you for your time uh, and for um, many of you representing voices of people who could not be with us today. Um, and I think like Josh, very keen to think about how we make um, this space more open, how we make the UPR more participatory, but also how we think about what happens in Geneva and how to make that um, something we can hold up to the current administration, but maybe if I have my uh, optimistic lens on the next administration and really thinking about the importance of building a record um, so that there is a blueprint for how we uh, can uh, respect human rights.